Touchdown Tampa Bay, you're listening to the PewterCast. Welcome to the PewterCast. I am Brent Allen, your host, back from a long weekend off. I'm not here by myself. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Ren Dax. Ren, back at it, buddy. Hello. Yeah, seems like we seems like we just got back at it, and then we had a little break, and now we're back at it again. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, uh, of course, if the team has a mini bye week, so do we. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought the Instacast was a lot of fun that Thursday night. We had a record number of people yeah, we did. In, in, in the chat room, you know, yeah. and uh, it, it was a really fun show. Got a lot of callers. Our international caller streak is continued. Yeah. Uh, but I was ready. Like, you know, yeah. like I was ready like Sunday. To talk oh yeah, about to, to get back and get again. in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, just to continue that with the instant cast. Not only did we have a record number of people who joined us live for the show, and uh, to, to all of you who did, we hope you continue to join us throughout the season uh, for the live shows of the instant cast. But uh, to everyone who has been downloading the show, it is uh, very easily our number one downloaded episode of the season so far. Uh, hopefully, we see this number crushed by the end of the season. But um, I, I haven't done the research on it, but this is one of the most listened to instant casts uh certainly that we've had um ever so you know lots of people joining the the pewter cast and, and listening in uh not just live but also on the downloads as well so uh welcome to everybody who is joining us for the first time this season uh but ren we are back at it this is our final thoughts episode this is the one where we usually get to talk to somebody down in in tampa uh somebody who's there in the building or or around the buccaneer organization uh and we'll be doing that and then we'll also get to talk a little bit about uh sort of the the final thoughts on what's been going on with the team although it's we've not just had a couple of days to think about it ren We've had a lot of days to think about it, so we'll, we'll I'm sure, go through that for, real quick. But our guest this week, very excited to have back on the show. It's been a while since he's been with us. Yeah. Greg Allman of The Athletic, formerly of uh, the Tampa Bay Times. He's really just a staple there in the media room, a staple around Tampa. And, and honestly, probably my personal favorite Twitter follower, like as far as just getting Bucks news and getting it out. Uh, he's usually right on top of it. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking about that like yesterday or maybe the day before. Mm-hmm. You know, when Trevor came in to sort of, you know, the Buccaneer fandom and, and the Twitter follow verse, like, you know, he took off like a rocket. Sure. Uh, but now he's, you know, he's doing sort of like two jobs. So you get, a, you know, you get some tweets that aren't exactly Buck centric, mm-hmm. you know. And of course, Trevor's, you know, uh, uh, Trevor Sickma from Peter Report, I'm talking about, is still a really great follow. But I'm with you. Like, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, Greg's Greg's the guy, man. Greg yeah. Greg's the guy to follow. If you're gonna follow one person yeah. and Twitter to get your Bucks info, you should follow at Rendax, R E N <laughs> underscore D A X T. But if you're gonna follow another, yeah, Greg's the guy. Yeah. Greg's the guy. Yeah, Greg Greg is the only one that I have his stuff sent like directly to the phone. You know, because because he'll give you that. Uh, I can't have everybody sent to the phone because my phone just blow up all day long. But um, especially when it comes time for like off season stuff, draft stuff. You know, Greg really is the guy. So, Ren, that was a great conversation we got to have with Greg. We've already recorded it as we usually do at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. So we'll get into that, and then after that episode or, or after that that talk, that conversation we had with Greg. Uh, Ren, you and I will be back to kind of put a capstone on this Bucks Panthers um, game. We'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, about some of the happenings that's been going on, certainly over this little mini bye week as we start to turn the corner and look towards this Giants game. So, so Ren, without further ado, that is what we are going to be doing on today's episode of The Beauty Games. Friends, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you took that special someone out on a date? How expensive was it? The average date night these days costs around 115 bucks, and that doesn't even include babysitters for the kids if you need them. Now look, I don't care who you are, that's just plain expensive, especially if you're on a budget. Well, what if I told you that you could have an incredibly fun and unique date night for the next six weeks, or even six months, for around $30 a night? Well, you can with Hunt a Killer. 
Hunt a Killer is the murder mystery box that immerses you in an ongoing experience in the comfort of your own home. With every box or episode, you'll dive deeper into the case, sift through the evidence and the case files, and you'll be running red string from pin to pin on a map until you crack the case and catch the killer. Now, if you've been listening to the show, you know that I've been trying out Hunt a Killer this summer, and I have just caught my first killer. Well, not just me, my wife and me. And I got to tell you guys, we loved this game. It was so much fun. Not only are we going to be diving into the new series coming out really soon, but this time we're going to be doing it with friends. So I guess that means double dates for me for a while. Listen, guys, this is a great, cost-effective way to spend time with friends and with loved ones working together and having a good time. Now, if that sounds like fun to you, I've got a special offer from Hunt a Killer. Just go to huntakiller.com and use the code PEWTERCAST for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use the code PEWTERCAST, that's all one word, for a 20% discount and to show your support for the PEWTERCAST. See if you have what it takes to hunt a killer. Since it has been a while and you haven't been an athletic, uh, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. we usually first time people on sort of tell us your story. Um, just sort of pick up how the opportunity of the athletic turned up. Yeah, it's a cool thing. Um, I was at the Times for uh, 19 years. Um, could have very been very happy staying at the Times. Um, you know, it's a tough time in newspapers. Uh, so yeah. There's not a lot of uh, stability right now, not a lot of job security. Um, and, and, you know, I had five good years covering the Bucks at the time. And the only concern I had was more just from a job security standpoint, just because I was the second writer working with Rick Stroud. Uh, and you just worry that um, if newspapers have to contract anymore, have to get any smaller, I'm um, the second guy on a beat, basically. Um, and, and fortunately, had a chance to go on with The Athletic. Um, this is a year ago in August, so whatever, 13 months ago, I guess. Um, and The Athletic has been an amazing thing for, for writers and for sports writers all over the country. Um, our, our staff continues to to get bigger and bigger. I think when I came on a year ago, it was probably about 150 writers, which was a staggeringly large, impressive number of people hired full time um, away from newspapers for the most part. Uh, And now we have I think we had a meeting last. I think over 300 writers, over 400 staff now, uh, people covering every NFL team, every baseball team, major league every hockey team, every basketball team, uh, like 90 college writers. We just expanded in London, covering Premier League soccer, um, covering the WNBA, covering sports business. It's it's really pretty amazing um, and a really cool thing to be a part of. So uh, it was hard to leave the Times. Um, Lots of good friends there. Again, 19 years of my life. Um, Pretty much I I wrote for them in college. So, I mean, with the exception of two years when I was working at CNN right out of school, that Times was the only place I'd worked for, really, in any kind of full-time capacity. so hard to leave, but um, at the same time, it, it, it's really rare in my business that you get to hop to a better job and don't have to move your family and don't yeah. have to change beats, which is really cool. Um, so basically covering the same team I did before, it's a very different um, product that we're putting out. Uh, not writing as much as I was with the Times, writing a good deal longer in most stories than I did at the Times. Uh, but like I said, really cool staff. We've got – about 60 NFL writers. Uh, there's two guys on a lot of teams. I'm flying solo right now with the Bucks, uh, but we have two in New Orleans. We have two in Carolina, uh, a bunch of places now. We have a second writer or an NFL columnist, a um, bunch of national writers. So, yeah, really cool group to be a part of. And uh, like I said, I just hit a year, I guess August 20th, I think was the year or so. About a month into my second year, it's been a lot of fun. Greg, uh, let me ask you, you, you just kind of said you're putting out a different product with The Athletic than – you were with the times um and you mentioned like length of your thing is a little bit different go into that like what is different about what they're wanting you to produce with the athletic versus um you know what you were getting with the times yeah i mean the folks at the athletic really believe in um the depth of what we write and and going into greater detail having the freedom to write uh it, it starts with more more room more more words obviously and i mean newspapers you have the space crunch of a printed product, but I mean, online, you can pretty much write as much as you want. But even with that, you know, I I think we use inch counts in newspapers, which are kind of strange jargon. But if you you use words, um, most of what I wrote for the Times, I was kind of a volume guy there. So you're doing kind of daily notebooks or journals, if you will. But even the long features you might write for a daily newspaper these days are rarely more than about what we'd call 30 inches which is usually there's about 35 words to an inch. So you're talking about a thousand words. 
And that would be, when I was at the Times, that would be a fairly big deal to write a thousand-word story. Um, and with The Athletic, there's, there's very much a focus on talking to more people, getting into more detail, sharing people's stories. Um, so you'll, you'll have stories where, I mean, with daily newspapers, um, there's kind of that daily grind. You've got to put something out for the next day's paper. So most of your feature stories are two-source stories or three-source stories where you're talking to a player. Uh, you have a quote from the head coach that says, yes, he's a great player. Maybe you have a teammate. And that's kind of where things are. And, again, it, it's what I did for 19 years. I enjoyed it very much. Um, with this new job with The Athletic, I have a chance to go into a little bit more depth. So right. um, I wrote like I wrote a feature on Alex Kappa two weeks ago that was like a 10-source story where uh, I talked to Alex, obviously, talked to Arian, talked to Light, uh, talked to Marpet and Jensen, and one other on the offensive line, talked to his high school coach, talked to his college coach, um, to where now is that, you know, you've got, like I said, eight or nine voices in a story. Ideally, they're all bringing something new to it. Um, and for lengthwise, a lot of what I like today, today was a very ordinary day in terms of what I wrote, uh, just off the the news that Daniel Jones is going to be the quarterback for the Giants on Sunday and kind of the Bucks' weird history against rookie quarterbacks. Um, and I think that was only maybe 1,200 words what I filed today, which is still uh, 35 inches, I guess. Right. So it's uh, it's longer. And again, some of the things I've gotten to do, some really cool bigger pieces. We did a big piece on the 1979 Bucks team 40 years later, and we talked to, I think, 16 guys from that team. And that was like a 5,000-word story. I mean, that's like 150 inches, uh, which you just don't really have a lot of room for in most outlets these days. But as a, as a big project, as a, a big 40-year look back, it's something we like to do. So um, longer stories, hopefully talking to more people, getting to go into a little bit more detail. That, that's a big part of what's different. Well, you talked about Daniel Jones there. And uh, so let's go ahead and start there. I have him sort of on my list of questions. Uh, I, I read some of your tweets about, you know, how at least recent Buccaneers teams haven't been that successful against rookie quarterbacks. Uh, and then you had some about rookie quarterbacks first start, you know, Arians and Bowles have faith in the Buccaneers has faced them. But what are some of the things, you know, besides, you know, just the mobility of Daniel Jones, or is that it? Like, what are some of the things that the Bucks defense sort of have to shift gears and, and, and prepare for, you know, from what you've looked at uh, with that piece you did on Daniel Jones? Yeah, it's, it was cool. Like we talked to, there's two guys, uh, the Bucks are such a young team that even when they're facing rookies for the first time, there's a lot of guys that have faced these guys in college. So, like mm-hmm. I talked today to MJ Stewart, who played at Carolina, and uh, uh, Jordan Whitehead, who played at Pitt, and both of those guys faced Daniel Jones when he was at Duke. So you can ask him what it was like. And they both actually had pretty good games. Like Whitehead had a pick against Daniel Jones, I think, in 17 in a pit win, um, MJ Stewart played him twice at Carolina, sacked him in the second game, had like three passes defensed. And the first thing they talked about was mobility. They said, just he's fast. If you if you give him a chance to get out of the pocket, he's going to run. He's going to take off. And that obviously was not an issue with Eli Manning here in the last decade, at least. Uh, so you go from somebody who's fairly immobile, stay in the pocket. Um, you're definitely facing a guy who's been in the league for 16 years. So he isn't going to get phased by a lot of crazy looks from the defense, that kind of thing. Eli Manning actually had a pretty good record against the Bucs. Um, I think he's five and one for his career. Um, and it's like in terms of all time winning percentage for a starting quarterback against the Bucs, there's like 64 guys. I figured this morning, 64 guys that have a hundred career passes against the Bucs and Eli's eight, which isn't bad. And like of the guys that are ahead of him, uh, Brady, Montana, and Peyton Manning are three of the seven ahead of them. There's some other weird ones there, like Wade Wilson is ahead of them. There's some random guys that just did really well against the Bucks. But he's been good against them. I mean, last year, I mean, last year, I think people remember Saquon Barkley because Barkley had three touchdowns in that game and rushed for 140 yards. But Eli Manning went 17 for 18 in that game against the Bucks last year, which is crazy. I mean, you don't you don't hit 95% or 92%, whatever 17 out of 18 is. It's hard to do that against air. So I do think there's a little bit of a sense of relief that the Bucks get to face somebody who's only had basically two minutes in the NFL. I mean, he came in, Cowboys crushed the Giants in week one, and they brought in Daniel Jones with like a minute 45 left. And he had three short passes, ran the ball once, and then fumbled and lost the fumble. And that's the extent of his NFL experience. So I think for uh, at least a defense like we're seeing the last two weeks, that's a good thing for the Bucs. They want to be able to have somebody they can rattle and get to 
um, get to make mistakes just because they've never been in the situation before. Um, that, that's a lot of what we wrote about today. Well, let's, you know, stay with the Buccaneers defense. Um, you know, Brent and I have been saying this ever since, you know, Arians got here and we started to see the moves during the offseason. A lot of it had to do with the amount of money the Bucks had, but – uh, with the lack of free agent signings and, and, and trades and whatnot, it was we're going to find out real quick if, you know, this past regime, if it was the players or the coaches. Um, and then seeing this Todd Bowles defense, it's small sample size, but it's definitely trending upwards towards, hey, it was the coaches. But I see a little kink in the armor with a couple of players. You know, uh, the first one that <laughs> sticks out for me is MJ Stewart. I thought it was a great design play, you know, that that uh, San Francisco ran, got him isolated, basically half the field one on one, you know, got the defense going one way, naked rollout. But then against Carolina, even though both passes were incomplete because Shaq Barrett pressures, there was, a, you know, the second fourth down uh, where Cam threw up his back leg and threw it out there and short hopped it to a wide open Samuel. Uh, and then again in the end zone, Shaq Barrett puts the pressure on Cam throws off his back legs and, you know, short hops it by a handful of yards. But the guy was open and, and both those times it was it was MJ Stewart uh, as well as this defense has played and everyone has looked is there is something that you've noticed or is there grumbling in the press box or the media room that uh you know MJ Stewart uh needs sort of pick up his game or you know these big plays that the Todd Bowles Duff Buccaneers defense is you know quote-unquote supposed to give up uh, are teams starting to find that chink in the armor yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be vulnerabilities to this defense. Um, I mean, the, the play you talked about where Richie James had a touchdown in week one was one where, again, I mean, that's just one where MJ Stewart just wasn't fast enough to cover him on, on a on a go route and got beat for a touchdown. I mean, I think there's probably supposed to be some safety help there that wasn't. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's a guy who, you know, was a corner and then got switched to nickel, was going to be a safety, and then went back to nickel. So he's kind of the nickel by default almost right now. I think they like the way he's – picks things up ideally probably at some point here murphy bunting is going to be the nickel i mean i think once he gets the speed of the nfl and gets himself acclimated that's probably where they see him fitting in right now uh but for now it's mj um you know i felt like he played pretty well i thought in the carolina game i think all the dbs seem to give up completions but seem to be really sure tacklers at getting guys right away yeah. um stopped them a decent amount of time stopped them short of the chains that kind of thing so i thought they were really good at being Sure, tacklers against Carolina probably gave up more completions than you'd like. I think Cam had maybe one off of his career high in completions. I mean, he threw whatever, 51 passes or something. This is probably not what you'd go in expecting to do with your Carolina. Uh, but under the circumstances, with the exception of maybe the two Olsen passes where he just got wide open down the middle, there was the one early pass where Hargrave got beat deep for whatever, 40 yards or something. Right. I thought on the whole, the pass defense held up pretty well under the circumstances. Right. And, you know, speaking, and that kind of leads me into the, the second chink in the armor, and I promise it's going to get positive after this. But, uh, you know, all fans, you know, of the Buccaneers are happy with what Kevin Minter did coming in, having to call the defense, not knowing he was going to play. Glad the vet's there. His run defense was outstanding, if not, you know, A+. plus. But you just mentioned those Greg Olson and, you know, catches, those long Greg Olson catches. And it seemed, you know, looking at the film that – that was sort of Minter's guy. Uh, is is that something that's been talked about? That you know that that yes, Minter. Maybe that's something that's holding him back. Is is yes, he's excellent at run defending, but we might have sort of a problem with this over the middle tight, you know, tight ends or you know these running backs that we're going to face coming up uh, with Minter sort of patrolling the middle of the field. Yeah, I mean, I think he's definitely stronger against the run than he is dropping back in pass coverage. Um, and you're right, and that he's getting pressed into duty during this insane run where they basically have five straight games all against under 25 elite NFL running backs. I mean, you go right. McCaffrey, Barkley, Gurley, Kamara, McCaffrey in five straight weeks, all of them not only good backs, but really good pass catching backs. I think it's three of the top four in the NFL last year. The The runt of the litter is, is, uh, is Gurley, who had 59 catches, which is still amazing numbers for a, a running back. So, yeah, I mean, stopping running backs, catching balls out of the flat is going to be a huge part of – the overall defensive game plan for the next month. And that's obviously easier with a guy like Devin White who's fast enough to run with any of those guys. Um, you know, Minter's, whatever, five years older, but it is a step slower. Um, I think one of the Olsen plays was definitely his. I think another one looked like Jordan Whitehead okay. had him going across the middle and kind of made a leap and, and was just a couple inches short. 
But, yeah, there, there's going to be seams in this defense. There's going to be vulnerabilities, especially when you're playing down a starter like they are. Um, and especially, I mean, you think about this week, I mean, Barkley had, I think, 80 catches last year. I mean, as good as he was just as a straight running back, they throw to him a ton. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure a rookie running, a rookie quarterback should say, I think you, you kind of lean on those, those safety valves, which are running backs dumping off out of the backfield, Evan Ingram as they dump off guy coming out of the backfield. I'm sure you'll see a lot more of that and a lot less stretch the defense, throw it deep, um, low percentage throws where a young quarterback might be off the mark and put you in trouble with the turnover. You just mentioned Jordan Whitehead and, uh, you know, sort of earlier how the defensive backs have have played well, uh, especially in the tackling. Um, One of the best plays that I thought in the Carolina game that no one's really talking about, and it's sort of like it's it's more of lack of didn't do something stupid, was uh, the last completion by Cam on the slant, you know, inside the uh, inside the five and Vernon tackled, but Mike Edwards came up and watching it live, I was expecting for him to sort of lower his shoulder and his helmet and, you know, you know, hit him in the back and it might be a helmet with a helmet or a spearing or something like that. But, you know, he used sort of used his lower body to kind of stop the receiver's for, forward progress to make sure he didn't get the first down. This was, uh, you know, I thought that went largely unnoticed. I thought it was a real smart play. But this was the first game where Edwards got to play a lot. He only played four snaps, you know, in the first week coming off injury, wasn't up to speed yet. He played a ton in the Carolina game. Um, you were there. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for this kid to show up. And, and so, we, you know, you keep hearing about the coaching staff, how good he is and smart he is, and he's going to be a starter right away. Uh, what did you see from Edwards in that Carolina game? You know, what stood out the most, and we talked to him kind of briefly afterwards, um, I, I feel like he didn't get exposed that much. There really weren't plays where he looked lost or was in the wrong place or anything like that. He had a near pick. I think there was a ball. It was impressive. Like, again, like every other play, we're going back to Shaq Barry pressure. But there right. was a ball that was just out of reach where he could have picked it off. Um, the tackles he made, again, seemed pretty sure as tackles go. So I, I thought he played very well. I mean, that, that first game, I think they just weren't positive that he was back and healthy from that, that hamstring that had signed him a couple weeks in the preseason. So, you know, they eased things in. They let Darren Stewart go. And Darren Stewart um, was kind of serviceable in that role in the first week. But, yeah, they're, they're really high on Mike Edwards. I mean, I think they, they want him to be a guy that's, that's versatile, that's a leader, that's a weapon that can use – they can use different ways as safeties go, um, blitzing, attacking, dropping back, covering tight ends, everything. Safety is kind of a, a huge position in the Bulls defense, um, going back to Arizona, going back to what Jamal Adams did in making the Pro Bowl in New York. It, it's a it's a position you have to have somebody that you've brought in specifically for it. So I think even though they waited till the third round to get him, he's exactly who they wanted for that. So even if it means you take some lumps with him early on, first month in the NFL, I think he's somebody they're really going to like and use and, and build around in that secondary by the, by the end of this year. Yeah. I liked what I saw. Uh, I, you know, like I said, I thought that was a really smart play, even, you know, it's, it, it seems so inconsequential, but if he did what I was expecting him to do, or, you know, watching sort of the Bucks shoot themselves in the foot year after year, that would have been, you know, first down, uh, you know, inside the five and, and probably game over. So uh, I guess, it might be a stretch, but you know, seeing his smart sort of in that play, knowing that he couldn't do that, I thought that I thought that was a really good sign. I want to switch. Well, and sides. if you go back, literally with Carolina, I mean, if you go back to the end of seventeen, uh-huh. if you remember, that game ended with a goal line stand where they couldn't make a stop, and that's the one where Chris Baker jumped off sides and basically allowed them to run out the game and win. Where yeah. you know McCoy Gall, and again, that's the same. I mean, that's Chris Baker's whatever a six year veteran making an idiotic mistake there, and here you have a rookie. You don't want to praise a guy just for not committing a penalty, but but had the sense <laughs> to kind of come up and not make a mistake or not draw a flag, and it kind of allowed them to escape there at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yes, it was it was deja vu all over again uh, near the end of the game for for Buck fans. Um, I want to switch aside the ball. I got a real quick one for you. Rojo, you know, Bruce Aaron said stubbed his toe. I heard him today. He re stubbed his toe. You were out there practice. Rojo was out there practicing, right? Yeah, he was out there. I mean, th- these extra day practices, this is kind of a bonus practice today. So the only way we're only there for maybe 20, 25 minutes at the start of practice. And the only way we can really tell even who's limited versus not participating is, is whether they brought a helmet out. So like today, uh, the O-line was actually doing some work. So DeMar Dotson was in a bucket hat today. We knew he was held out. Devontae Bond didn't have a helmet with him. Rojo did. So, I mean, again, I'm sure he'll be limited this week. He'll be listed as limited. Uh, if you look at him, I think he stepped – it might have been he stepped on O.J. Howard's foot. There was somebody who was blocking for him on that 12-yard run. He had a nice run. He only really had one big run yeah. Thursday in Carolina. 
But on that run, he just, I mean, he came up and right away reached for his ankle, kind of went to the sidelines. You saw him kind of trying to test it. And I think they just made that decision at that point, okay, well, Barber's running the ball well. Let's just stick with Barber. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's indicative of anything more than just the situation on that night. Um, and Barber kept running well, so there was no need to really test a guy who, who may or may not be at full strength. Greg, I got a, I got a question for you about the whole Peyton Barber Rojo thing. Um, just really kind of from your vantage point of view, as you've seen it, Ren and I have talked quite a bit about it, but uh, kind of the theory that we've been putting out there is that, uh, you know, they're going to play Peyton Barber. You know, Bruce Arians talked up Peyton Barber a lot in this uh, preseason as well as he did Rojo. Um, but the idea being, you know, come the end of the season, you know, Peyton is going to be looking for a big payday, probably will cash in, go somewhere else. And, and Rojo might be that, you know, looking for Rojo to step into that number one spot. But we've also been talking about, you know, that could happen really at any time this season if Rojo steps up. Do you kind of see that being true as well? Like they're really wanting this to turn into the kind of the Rojo show as far as running back goes. And how is he doing with that, you know, this early in the season so far? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they put a second round pick into Rojo. So they did that, you know, the year after Barber led them in rushing. So you could mm-hmm. tell that, at least as an organization, that there's that wanting a little bit more from the position. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Peyton Barber is an undrafted guy to stick on the roster and then to lead the team in rushing his second and third year, even if it's doing it with, you know, kind of lackluster numbers, mm-hmm. is great for what he needed them to be. Um at the same time, it's like their running game as a whole was not good. I mean, I think they were 29th in yards per game. I think they were 31st in yards per carry. Um, I think Peyton Barber is like the only guy in the last five years to have 250 touches in a season and not have 1,000 yards. Mm-hmm. It's kind of yeah. like if you're that unproductive normally, you just don't get the ball that much. So as much as they didn't do anything in the draft, as much as they didn't add anybody in free agency, I think it's a position they expect more from. So. Right. That starts with Ronald Jones, you know, and for Rojo to come in, have the offseason he had, all the positivity he went with that, have a good preseason. It wasn't even anything that big in the preseason. It just looked much better than he did the year before. And then in the Niners game, I mean, he had more yards in the Niners game than he had his rookie year. Right. So um, it's not some gaudy numbers where he ran for like 160 or something. But I do think there's kind of momentum on his side. Barber's the same guy he's been. He's going to get yards for you. He's going to move the chains. He's not going to get more than about four yards a carry. Um, But he's dependable. I think they like him in pass protection. He can Mm -hmm. catch the ball every once in a while if they need him to. So I I think of Barber as kind of the known commodity. It's kind of like you know you're going to get a, a good B out of him. And I think they just hope that Rojo can be an A. I think there's just more upside that he can be a thousand yard guy. He can be someone who takes some of the pressure off Winston that mm. gives them the balance they want on offense. And that'll be a gradual thing. I mean, like you said, Barber's a free agent after this year. He might want to go somewhere um, where he's paid more or where he has a, a clearer, better role. Mm. So, yeah, this does kind of guard against that because, I mean, Jones, they get Jones for three more years mm. counting this year just on his rookie deal. So you want to yeah. kind of use that time as a running back to, to get the most out of their early years while they're young and they're healthy and in their prime. Yeah, beat them up while they're cheap. Don't say that out loud. Right, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's the Levy on Bell theory, right? <laughs> okay, I've yeah. got uh, sort of a two-parter here, and I'd like you to address both of these. Um, uh, I, I've seen you come out and I don't want to say defend, but but bring a little uh, sanity to this. OJ Howard is broken uh, conversation that's going on with <laughs> Buck fans, right? And also the people that think oj howard is broken that's why we're going to trade him to jacksonville for jalen ramsey can you please tell us if <laughs> i'm pretty sure you're with me on this one but if not that's fine can you please tell us why oj howard is not broken and why the bucks aren't taking to, are going to trade for jalen ramsey yeah it, it's funny it's like there's some areas where i think joe fan on twitter just the generic fan on twitter can be really spot on and understand things and, and get how things work And I think the downside kind of a fantasy football is that any trade seems plausible in the minds of some fans to where it's like uh, somebody's like, why why don't they just trade Winston for Ramsey straight up? I mean, the Jaguars need a quarterback. And I was like, well, kind of. But I mean, they just gave Nick Foles a three-year deal with multi-years guaranteed. You, You don't just pay two quarterbacks $20 million a year because one of them got hurt for part of one season. So, yeah, I think, unfortunately, we're just in this world where, because in fantasy football, if someone doesn't do well, you can drop them that day, or you can trade them to a buddy for running back depth or something. 
I think there's that extrapolation that why shouldn't the real NFL do the same thing? So, yeah, so O.J. Howard owners in fantasy football are not happy um, in that we spent the whole summer saying, like, oh, O.J. Howard, if he's healthy, it's going to be a Pro Bowl, he's going to have a great yeah. year. Um, kind of fended off a lot of the Bruce Arians has never had a tight end play well uh-huh. type talk. And, again, it was easy to explain that, like, Bruce Arians really hasn't had any tight ends as talented um, as the one-two he has with Howard and Braid. And then Howard has, you know, a very surprising, uncharacteristically bad first game, you know, where he fumbles in the red zone. Um, and then even that, if you look at that, I mean, Fred Warner made a really great tomahawk to knock that ball out. I almost feel bad for OJ. He wasn't holding the ball wrong. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He just – defender made a great play, and he lost the football. Um, which Fred is still Warner fault. is a really good linebacker that no one knows about. Yeah, totally. I, I came away from that game so impressed with who he is and went back and watched him and said, I, I've completely missed on this guy. The, the second one was a bad miss. O- OJ just let the ball go off his fingers. He can't do that. That's 100% on him. Um, so you have two bad plays. I think OJ had four for 32 in the first week. And then um, I actually went back and watched Thursday's game, literally just watching the game to see what OJ Howard did on every play. And I charted whether he ran around, whether he was a run blocker, whether he was in on pass blocking. Um, and he didn't have a bad game against the Panthers. Um, like the, the OPI he had against him, he extended his arm. It's, it's a literal violation of the rule, but it wasn't anything heinous. It wasn't anything egregious uh, as mistakes go. And that was the only target he got the whole game. I think it was just a priority for them to use him to protect the quarterback and to help in the run game. So he had, I think he had 19 routes run on 54 offensive plays, which is not a lot. Uh, again, if you're a fantasy football guy, all you're seeing is zero targets. That's all that matters. So you're angry. You're trying to figure out why Bruce Arians hates O.J. Howard. <laughs> will they trade him? Please, can they trade him anywhere else? Trade him the Jaguars, trade him the Cowboys. We heard it all. He had a good game. I mean, if you look at the touchdown that Chris Godwin caught, yeah. O.J. Howard runs a slant, goes to the left, and draws the safety away and just creates this perfect passing lane for Winston to find Chris Godwin. If you look at Peyton Barber's 16-yard touchdown, yeah. uh, Howard lines up as a fullback. He did that on three plays, but he lines up as a fullback, and he took Luke, Luke Keekley out of the play. I mean, yep. he blocks the left side of that hole. Donovan Smith had the right side. There's this beautiful hole that Barber runs through for a 16-yard touchdown that ends up being the winning margin of the game. So I felt like when I went back, I mean, I had asked Bruce, like, why is OJ not clicking the way we expect him to in this offense? And sometimes Bruce, I think, can be um, vague and contrarian just to motivate people. So Bruce is like, well, you have to ask him. Um, and he said, like, I think he can play a lot better. He can play a lot better than he's been playing. To where it's like, oh, wow, now the coach is really just he, – he didn't have a bad game. When I look at his game on Thursday, he had one play where Addison beat him. Addison beat him one-on-one for a sack fairly late in the game. But, again, it, a tight end one-on-one against a, a Pro Bowl defensive end, I don't know that I expect him to win that battle every time. So I, I, he came back today, and, and kind of today was more of a cheery, rosy, hey, the balls are going to come. Don't worry, O.J. Howard. Just, you know, keep playing. It's going to work out fine. So I, I think you look at what O.J.'s done against the Giants the last two years. Um, had a long touchdown. I think he had two for 64. Um, you know, his first three games in the league, he had two quiet games and then had a big game against the Giants in week three, his rookie year. So he's done this before. Um, I would not be surprised if he gets the normal five, six, eight targets on Sunday, has a good game at home, catches the touchdown, and everybody's back off the ledge, and O.J. Howard's great, and I'm so mm-hmm. glad they took him and all this. Uh, Greg, I've got one more question for you, and this this will be it for me. But while you're in this vein sure. – Talk to us about Mike Evans, who has mostly been somewhat invisible, uh, really, for these last for these first couple of weeks. I know there was the illness and you know various things, but you know what what's going on with Mike Evans? Is he just being taken out by the defenses, or you know, is there something else going on here? Full disclosure: Brent has yeah, OJ I mean, I... and Mike Evans in fantasy. It is true. I you you talk about right. fantasy owners that are mad. You're talking to me right now. <laughs> Right, and I felt like um, Mike had an amazing catch on that 40-yard sideline catch mm-hmm. over yeah. the shoulder. Probably the prettiest ball to Jameis threw the whole game, and it kind of jump-started him at a time when the offense hadn't moved very well. Uh, mm-hmm. Bradbury's a good corner, shut down Evans one of the two games last year. I forget which one it was. So I went in thinking they're going to try and take away Evans. It's going to open up things for Godwin, and they kind of did that. And to some extent, I kind of feel like Evans is one of those guys who you shouldn't let – an opponent just take him out of a game. Like, unless right. you're up 35 nothing because the other guy's wide open. In a close game, if he hasn't had a big role, you probably should have thrown him the ball a little bit more. 
Um, they always talk about how Mike, you know, those, those 50-50 balls aren't really 50-50 balls with Mike Evans because he's so good. Part of it, I felt like, was that they they didn't have a lot of downs where they got into the red zone, which is kind of where he's best for those. Um, it's like Mike had one nice third down catch on a quick slant. He had the long ball. And if he had one other catch, that might have been it. Um, so, yeah, he's been quiet. Godwin, Godwin has certainly looked a lot better because he has two touchdowns in two games. I just think that's kind of where things are. I mean, like this week – uh, we talked to Mike today. He he likes playing the Giants. He's a big Janoris Jenkins fan. I'm sure that's who he'll see the most of. Um, but it's like he's—I don't think he could name another corner on the Giants. I mean, he was—he was just getting into learning them and what to do there. Um, and I think he had chawed with Eli Apple maybe the first time they played them, that kind of thing. But like I said, this is a game where I mean, Giants gave up a lot of points. Um, they're like minus four in turnover margin. We kind of should feel a little bit comfortable. I think they have two interceptions to the defense, but. Uh, this is a game where you should be able to kind of take more chances downfield. This isn't as nearly a good affront as what they saw in San Francisco or Carolina. Um, the Bucks. Someone said the Bucks are a touchdown favorite for only the second time in ten years, which is crazy to think about. But this is a game they should expect to win. Um, momentum from their last game. They're home, even though it's a team that beat them last year. You know, you go back to that game last year, and the Bucks didn't have Quan. They didn't have Levante. So. To be down your best two linebackers against Saquon Barkley is not a recipe for success. I think even though they're probably down Devin White here, I think they're in better shape with Levante and Minter than they were a year ago with whatever that was, Adarius Taylor and Minter or whatever the combo was in that game. So I would expect to see more Mike Evans. He's fine. It's not that he's doing wrong. I think he's, he's absolutely the number one thing defenses are trying to take away from this offense. And just so far, they've been able to do that these first two weeks. So I'll keep starting both of these guys. Thanks, Greg. Keep starting my day. <laughs> curse, me, want... curse me Sunday if he has like three targets for two catches and 18 yards or something. But, yes. <laughs> do you want to uh, address the Jalen Ramsey thing or do you just want to roll your eyes and go put your kids to bed? No, I mean, I can briefly address it. Just cause, I mean, fans, this is that point where um, I think fans see a name that they've known for a couple of years that they're excited about that normally wouldn't be available and it's exciting. So, again, there's that knee trigger where I get 10 people a day. They're like, hey, you think the Bucks could go? I, I wish the Bucks would go after Ramsey. Um, and it's funny because right now they're floating like two number ones as the price for him. And, and yeah. I think some people get it, but clearly not enough people get it because they're asking me all day long. Um, <laughs> the Bucks have put a ridiculous amount of resources into their defensive secondary yes, in the are. last, especially the last two drafts. Um, you look at their starting five in the secondary and nickel right now. Three of them are draft picks from last year in, in Carlton Davis, in Jordan Whitehead, in MJ Stewart. So those guys in their second year of rookie contracts, very much developing, ascending as players. Um, you know, you add Mike Edwards, who's a rookie right now that they just draft, current coach, current GM, that doesn't even count Dean and Bunting, who will be there at cornerback. The only guy that's in a position to really leave in the next year or two is Hargraves. So, mm-hmm. um They've got a lot invested in the position. So it's not that don't, – don't get me wrong. It's not – Jalen Ramsey would make this team better. Jalen Ramsey would make any secondary in the NFL better. It's just a matter of where do you want to put your biggest resources. And you don't have any resources bigger than your first-round draft pick. So if you do that, absolutely, they're a better defense. It probably translates to a win all by itself, just having Jalen Ramsey. But then next year, when everyone's asking to get a tackle and everyone's asking to get an outside pass rusher in the draft, it's like, well, no, we, um, we use that pick to get Jalen Ramsey, who we're now paying $15 million a year to as the most expensive player on our defense. So it, it's hard. I, I think with the Pierre Paul thing, people are like, oh, it pays off to trade for existing established NFL talent, but it's really not a good habit to do regularly. You can either put a draft pick into somebody or put crazy money into somebody, but to do both on a regular basis is not a good use of your resources. So like I said, they're, they're going to trade him at some point, I'm sure. He's going to go somewhere else. He's going to make plays for someone else, and everyone's going to be angry that Jason Light didn't make the trade. But I think as an NFL team, you have to be aware of what you've done, what your plan has been, and just are you messing with that plan unnecessarily just when someone comes available. Because like Minka, Minka Fitzpatrick, again, would be an upgrade on MJ Stewart at nickel, would be an upgrade at safety. Um, but I mean, the Steelers, I mean, if the Steelers don't do well, they will have sent what could be a top 10 pick to Miami uh, to upgrade their secondary. Don't get me wrong, it'll make them better, but but so would that draft pick next spring, especially if you don't know who your quarterback is. And if they're a bad team, you might be able to get the second quarterback off the board in April. 
They can't do that now. Um, and they've upgraded their secondary, but they have potentially a long-term hole at quarterback. So it's hard because every time somebody comes available, every time somebody with a little bit of baggage off field says they want to be traded, the hands go up. And on Twitter, I got everybody saying, hey, can, uh, Bucks, Bucks could really use Antonio Brown. He'd make them better. <laughs> um, and you just kind of have to talk to people and go, yes, he would make them better. It's not the best thing for them to do to pay another receiver $15 million a year. Right. So, yeah, it's it's fun to talk about, and I get why fans want every piece of talent they can get, but it's just not what the Bucks are going to do. All right. Well, Greg, man, I, I really want to thank you for your time tonight, and, and I know we've got to let you go. So uh, real quick, uh, you are over at theathletic.com. Um, people want to go over there, subscribe, uh, you know, support what you're doing over there. Can you give us a little insight? Do you have anything coming up that uh, Bucks fans should be on the lookout for? Yeah. Um, actually, it's a fun week. This is a week where um, – you have that extra week or extra couple of days with the bye week where you can do more stuff. So, no, I'm excited. Um, I talked to Von Miller today. So I got a feature on Shaq Barrett coming out. Nice. Um, his whole story, it, it's really cool. I mean, Shaq Barrett's a really cool story. John, Jason Light likes these grinder types of guys that were undrafted, were walk-ons, um, had a point where it didn't look like they'd even stick in the NFL, mm-hmm. and they've pushed through it, and they're that much hungrier for it. So even when you pay them good money like they did Shaq Barrett, they feel like you're going to get that same – effort and output so like Shaq Barrett was undrafted he, he started his college career as a walk-on at Nebraska Omaha hmm. um, and then Nebraska Omaha folded their football program after one year so he transfers to Colorado State is an absolute star there he's like defensive conference player of the year um, but it's like he's not in good shape his percent body fat after his senior year as a conference player of the year is 24 percent oh which God. i don't know what i'm at i'm probably not at 24 percent but nfl players shouldn't be at 24 percent right um so he goes undrafted spends an entire year on the broncos practice squad gets cut the next year makes it back on the squad gets himself in shape he said today he thinks he's at 12 percent, which is awesome to think about cutting your body fat in half and again he's just had an amazing two weeks he's got four sacks he's exactly what they needed as somebody who didn't cost them a whole lot but helps uh, – they didn't even know it at the time – but helps make up for the fact that Jason Pierre-Paul is, is in South Florida mm-hmm. with a you know, neck fracture. So anyway, right in Shaq Barrett. Uh, it's probably tomorrow. Um, it's a cool week with Ronde Barber on Sunday going to the Ring of Honor. So I oh, yeah. uh, talked to a bunch of people about Ronde. Uh, looking forward to writing about him. Actually writing about Sarah Walsh too. Um, Sarah Walsh is the sideline reporter for Fox on Sunday. Um, and it's just a really cool thing. She's the one that got laid off from ESPN two years ago while she was on maternity leave with twins. Oh, yeah. um, and she's really, really jumped in and, and done a great job at Fox. She's doing everything for them. She's going to be in Athens for Georgia Notre Dame on Saturday. Then she goes back and she's in Tampa doing sidelines. She's working with Rondé and Kenny Albert as part of their crew. Uh, she's done NASCAR for Fox, done all kinds of stuff. She's doing soccer with the U.S. women's national team. So just a fun story. She's from our area. She's from Gulf High School, played soccer there right here in Tampa. So writing on her, so those are these three stories, I think. Ronde, Sarah, Shaq, that I'm trying to crank out here between now and the game on Sunday. Well, that was Greg Allman of the Athletic dot com talking with us Ren I uh, didn't realize until we kind of got into that conversation just how long it's been since we've had Greg on the show uh, you know he's a guy we talk to quite a bit uh, offline I guess uh, <laughs> you know but it, it's just he's a great guy to get in and, and be able to talk Buccaneers football yeah you know it's like you said in the intro we'll be like these people that are in the building and once again it's one of those people you can go hey uh hmm. MJ Stewart. Right. You know, and he's got thoughts and what do you got? You know, yeah, and Greg's been doing it so long, like you heard him, he just you know, he was out said he was walking around the neighborhood and he was pulling all these stats out about Peyton Barber's last year's running mm-hmm. stats and everything. But what I found most interesting was uh I guess Shaq Barrett cutting his, his uh, body fat in half. Yeah, that that was uh, that was one you looked at me and I kind of think gave you a little fist pump. And my immediate thought was, man, if, if I cut my body fat in half, uh, I'd still be fat. <laughs> like I need to do it twice. <laughs> all right. Great job, Brent. Now do it all over. again. Do it again. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I didn't know that about Shaq Barrett. And, you know, when he talked a little bit about the Alex Kappa deal, you know, mm-hmm. that's. That was when, you know, I'm sort of this person, I've said it a few times in the pod, like, I think your apps should work for you, not work for your apps. It's one of the reasons why I hate Facebook. Sure. You know, uh, 
But uh, when he had that Alex Kappa article, and it came out right at the time, you know, it was in like you know, I don't remember if it was during OTAs or training camp, but we knew as you know, plugged in Bucks fans that uh, a lot is writing on Alex Kappa. Yeah, you know, and like he said, instead of doing instead of finding a story for free that has you know, you talk to Kappa and you get a quote from you know, you ask the coach, head coach, something about Kappa just so you can get a quote, uh-huh. slap it in the article, and then maybe talk to an you know, like Dotson next to him or or mm-hmm. Ryan Jensen and ask them like one or two questions in open locker room. You know, with the athletic, you have this platform to be able to you know talk to five, six, seven, yeah. eight, nine, ten people. And that was the article that got me, you know, to spend like the five bucks. Uh, I don't remember what it was. It wasn't mm-hmm. that expensive. And then all the stuff he's talked, he talked about, like now they cover like soccer, you know? Yeah. They're, oh yeah. They have everything. They're covering the premier league. So, you know, as a person who's really not hip uh, mm-hmm. to paying for my online content. Right. Um, it, it's these sort of long form, almost magazine type articles that Greg does, uh, just for the Buccaneers, for the amount of money is, I, I really, really think it's worth it. And you know, you had to, you had to drag me kicking and screaming to get there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It it was one of those things. I, I don't know. People who've been following the show for a while may have picked up on. Sometimes I, I like a little bit more of the behind the scenes type stuff. So you know, when he started talking about the difference between what he was doing with the Times and what he was doing here with the Athletic, uh, because I I have felt for the last year like something has been different. I just wasn't able to kind of put my finger on it. And basically, when he said, "Yeah, I get to just basically," he has more space to breathe, mm-hmm. and he's looking for a different type of product. And as you mentioned, like that Alex Kappa feature, you know, he can he can do more personality driven stuff. And I was thinking. When he was talking about it that like yeah that is more of what he's been doing you know more more about the players and the people around um and that's where you come up with ideas like yeah Shaq Barrett has cut his body fat in half yeah I had no idea yeah that's that's great I had no idea the reason he get drafted because he was you know pudgy well Ren as we're talking about Shaq Barrett I I do want to go ahead and let's talk about him for just a minute because he came out in this last game this Carolina game and kind of has become like the new star of the defense, at least for this week he has been. Uh, Pulled out two sacks or three sacks. He has four sacks on the season. Um, You know, I I think I saw at some point he's leading the NFL in sacks right now. He was before Monday night's game. Before Monday night's game. So, uh, you know, people changing his name to Sacks Barrett and stuff. Um, You know, we know he's a guy who came over. He was backing up Vaughn Miller. I think Greg had mentioned that he – uh, had spoken to Von Miller about Shaq Barrett for the piece he's doing on him. Yeah. But, I mean, we're only two games in, right? Yeah. Like, like we're just two games in. We're not that far in yet. But, you know, is it is Shaq Barrett really the real deal, The you know, the real McCoy when it comes to, to this position and, and being possibly the, the bright spot of our pickup here for the offseason? You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, a few pods ago, I think definitely before the season started, I said something like, you know, how were the Buccaneers going to sell tickets you know, before they got Ndamukong and Sue. And uh-huh. I, I, I made a joke as in like being a, you know, a cold caller trying to sell tickets for the Buccaneers and be, right. hey, uh, hey, uh, we got Shaq Barrett. Like, uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you want to you spend a couple grand on some uh, some seats? Right. And, <laughs> and you know, at, at the time it, it was funny. And, and now it's kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, I do. I do want to <laughs> speak of the Shaq Barrett. Um, we will see. And this is basically, you know, it's something I thought a little bit about, um, after that game, uh, we're going to see if Shaq Barrett is quote unquote, you know, sort of this diamond in the rough, Aladdin elite pass rusher who never got a shot Mm -hmm. or he just had a really good game against inferior opponent because Bruce Aaron said in his presser today, and we're recording this Tuesday night, uh, is that, teams are going to start looking out for him now like they're going to plan after that game right like they're gonna have a like double team him, have a tight end chip on him have a back chip on him like they're going to make their game plan to make sure uh you know Shaq Barrett isn't the reason they lose the game now if he can do that and still you know get a lot of you don't have you don't have to get three sacks you know mm-hmm. but a sack with a handful of pressures or you know a bunch of pressures with no sacks or mm-hmm. you know still you know show up in the in the stat sheet in a in a positive way 
then we'll sort of get our answer. And I think these next weeks are crucial for sort of like Shaq Barrett and, you know, and him going forward and what possibly the Buccaneers might pay him or somebody else on the open market because he signed a one year deal. And, uh, you know, if if he starts doing, you know, keeps this up, you know, somewhere around week eight, week nine, we might just sort of see, you know, it just pops up out of nowhere. The Bucks have re-signed Shaq Barrett for three years. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and not sort of let him get out there to the open market. So mm-hmm. it'll it'll be exciting to watch. But yes, it, he's been a more than pleasant surprise for these first two games. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, let's stick with the defense, though, as we're looking at this. I mean, the defense certainly was impressive. If you go back and listen to our instant cast, which I think we touted in the intro is uh, definitely our, our one of our most listened to episodes ever uh, at this point. It's certainly one of our fastest listened to episodes. Um, we really had a good time watching the defense this last week. Uh, really the last couple of weeks, right? Well, one of us did. <laughs> um, no, but like, I mean, we were very, very impressed. But Ren, I, I want to ask, now that you've had a really an extended amount of time to sit back and, and digest it, is the defense still as impressive to you now that you're thinking about it, when you're thinking about the offensive line, the secondary, you know, the or not, I'm sorry, the defensive line, the secondary, that whole wrap. Um, you know, where where are you on the defense right now? Well, y- you know, it's it's exciting to see, especially what we've been seeing the past few years, past three years. You know, sort of mm-hmm. under this. Besides the, that, those five weeks that mm-hmm. were in a row. Besides that, you know, it's it, it was pretty awful to watch under the. You know, can we can, can can I say like. Can we go ahead and just kind of give like that five weeks like its own little like asterisk like we don't have to keep bringing it up because I know I always feel like we need to like yeah. just kind of go yeah the last three weeks have been total shit except for those five weeks like we don't have to say that anymore like we could just you know wipe that away I'm not wiping away just it's understood right like so like in a few weeks when we play the Panthers again and we have to bring up Gerald McCoy we don't have to say what a great community guy is before oh my we- gosh if I if I <laughs> hear that that uh, uh. <laughs> Or, right. or when defending Jameis, we don't have to say how bad the defense or the run game has been. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um. Yes, I, I would like that. I'm with you. Yeah. We will start that. So as bad as the defense has been the past three years, except for uh, <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um. I totally forgot I was going with this. Oh, from what we've seen, so what we've seen the defense now, uh-huh. you know, they've only given up one touchdown. Yes, two got called back on, you know, against against the 49ers, but it was in the same drive. So essentially maybe only one more could have been scored. Uh, it's very exciting. But as I was talking to Greg and I was sort of, you know, probing for information on what's going on there in the media room, um, you know, I do see chinks in the armor. You know, yeah. this defense is going to give up big plays. There are going to be holes in there. There are going to be seams to be found. Any defense is, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, Greg mentioned how great it was. What well, he didn't say how great it was, but he had mentioned how the defensive backs have been there for even when they give up a reception, they're right there to make the tackle mm-hmm. and they don't miss the tackle. You know, uh, I thought the defense sort of gave up the edge and missed some tackles, you know, late in that 49ers game. Um, but again, you know, they kept them out of the end zone. Uh, for the most part. Um, so, but this MJ Stewart at nickel really is, it bothers me. Um, mm-hmm. I'm afraid that teams are going to find the weak link and pick on it. And they're going to be able to scheme, you know, deep plays. The plays I'm talking about, one, he gave up a touchdown. One, it would have been given up a first down on a long ball and a fourth down if it wasn't for the pressure from Shaq Barrett. So, you know, it, it, it's sort of hard to be like, oh, MJ Stewart, your fault. But the guy was wide open. Right. You know, and then again, you know, when it was they were down there on the goal line, it was before all the timeouts and all that sort of stuff. You know, Cam tried to hit. uh, I don't remember if it was Samuels or who it was, you know, that was running an out in the end zone. And again, he was wide open. But of course, from the pressure, Cam threw up his back foot and short hopped it. But having seen those three plays where an offense schemed to get a guy open against MJ Stewart, even though two of them fell, you know, harmlessly incomplete they were wide open um you know and again with the kevin minter thing that i talked to greg about you know again sort of fishing for this type of deal minter you know you can't say anything negative really about the way he played coming in off the bench yes he's a veteran but he had to make all the defensive calls Mm -hmm. you know and you know and he played great against the run um even uh, had some pressures in, you know, when he was asked to blitz, uh, got home a few times at least to get in Cam's face, be able to throw the ball early. But, you know, Greg said one time it was Whitehead's fault, one time it was Minter's fault. Um, 
I just don't feel comfortable with him sort of roaming the field in a, in a, in a zone based defense uh, behind that pressure uh, coming up with these running backs and, and, and not be able to stay with, you know, with tight ends. It was, now, hopefully he gets coached up, but those are two of the things that, you know, as a level-headed Bucks fan, like, we're not going to shut everybody out. People right. are going to score. You know, we're going to have games where the offense is going to have to win it for us because the defense just doesn't have their best day. There's other really good coaches in the league. The other team gets, you know, paid to. We're going to play some very good teams. Right. You know, uh, and it starts, you know, I don't sort of want to bypass the Giants game, mm-hmm. but – I would not be surprised if, you know, we had to put up 30 plus to beat the Rams. Sure. You know, they've got they've got a lot of weapons. So uh, those are the two things I'm looking at. But I am nitpicking overall. You know, like I said, at the Instacast, I I want to have Todd Bowles children. It's just the night and day difference from from what we've seen to what we saw. It's uh, it's great. And, you know, sort of back to something I've said, it's like this defense is just going to keep us in games. Sure. You know, that's why turning the ball over is not turning the ball over is so important right now because if you don't turn the ball over and the defense keeps you in games, it, we're you know you're sort of that 500 team where mm-hmm. it's the fourth quarter. There's two minutes left. Somebody has the ball, either us or them, and like it's going to be a one score. You know, mm-hmm. it's like like we have to stop them or they have to stop us, and it's going to be like that. 10 11 12 out of these 16 games yeah yeah and, and so far it's been so far we're two for two right and that's the way it is in the nfl you know when I mean, you're yeah when you're a decent to good team right but i mean i mean even cutter talked about that during the last couple of years of his of his tenure here of you know we were we were on the losing end of one score games mm-hmm. you know they had uh, eight one score games and they lost you know seven of them or six of them or yeah. something like that. Like, you, yeah, I think they're got like to, one in seven. Yeah. Like you've got to be able to win those one score games. And when I look at this particular game, the Panthers game, a lot of people are kind of giving the caveats to it. Yeah. But they could have had that interception. I mean, should have had an interception, right? Jameis should, uh, the, I, I forget who it was with the Carolina. Oh, the Luke Keekly. Yeah. Yeah. Keekly. Yeah. He should have caught it, but he didn't, you got to come down with those kind of balls or, you know, McCaffrey should have put it into the end zone right there at the very end, or at least gotten that first down. Um, you know, they, they should have, you you know, it's a lot of coulda, shoulda, woulda. The truth is, at the end of the day, the Buccaneers stood up and didn't allow them to get in. You know, yeah. and this becomes the difference between a Bruce Arians type team and a Cutter type team is you're going to flip yeah. the the script on these you know close games, these one score games. Yeah, the coulda, shoulda, woulda. I mean, we've been doing that for since we started the pewter cast, right? Sure. You That's know, why we exist yeah. is so we can, you know, say, yeah, but, you know, the Bucks aren't as bad as they might seem. Well, he doesn't have a running game. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, you know, Jeremy McCoy needs help. Well, you know, the line's not blocking for, you know, Doug Martin. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. could have, should have, would have. But, you know, those are the pl- – and you're right. Those are the plays that need to be made. And if you mm-hmm. want to put on the flip side, you know, Jameis threw two dimes in the end zone. Yeah. You know, that weren't caught. You know, like put one right there on Mike Evans for – for some reason he wanted to go up with one hand and the mm-hmm. other one he put right through Perryman's hands, like mm-hmm. right through his hands, like right in between them. Right. And, you know, so it's, yeah, could have, should have, would have caught those, but they didn't. Could have, mm-hmm. should have, would have picked off Jameis and could have, should have, would have had those plays that MJ Stewart let his guy be wide open, but they, you know, but they didn't. Could have, should have, would have snuck Cam on, on, you know, on fourth down and on the right. goal line, but you didn't. So, yeah. So, uh, we talk about the defense being impressive. I want to talk about the offense a little bit, particularly in this game, but kind of overall, like, yeah, the Buccaneers won. As you mentioned, there were some bright spots, a couple of dimes that Jameis threw, although they didn't get, you know, they, they weren't caught. There were a couple of actually really great, great throws and catches that were made. Um, you know, the, the running game was better, but not, you know, overly amazing. The, the offense was not efficient on third down, but nobody was that day. We went 12 for, or two, two for 12 and third down efficiencies. Uh, Carolina only went three for 14, but I mean, you know, the offense, as I'm a little further away, just doesn't like, like, I don't, I don't know what it is yet. Like it doesn't feel like it's clicking just yet. Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel, I I don't know what's the right word. I don't know if you can help me out with that. Like, sure. Like something feels off right now. Well, yeah, they haven't, you know, the word we like to use is gelled. Okay. You know, haven't gelled yet. Um, I feel that there's two reasons for this in each game. One was sort of that OJ Howard fumble and OJ Howard pick 
mm-hmm. you know, like, and then a kneel down. Like, that was the whole entire second quarter for the mm-hmm. Buccaneers. Like, we never really had the ball in the second quarter. Right. You know, we fumbled, then whatever, Frisco did their thing. Then we, uh, you know, had an interception, then Frisco did their thing, and we got the ball, and that's the end of the second quarter. It was just, mm-hmm. it, you couldn't really, you know, start a rhythm. Uh, and then, and, and same thing in the Panthers game in the second quarter, you know, the penalties started to pop up. Right. The O.J. Howard, uh, you know, offensive pass interference. There was a couple of false starts. There was a holding penalty. And all that was sort of in the two, three drive first half sort of era. But mm-hmm. the offense isn't going to be what we're used to seeing. You know, mm-hmm. you know, we're used to seeing like every pass that comes out of Jameis Winston's hands is going to go. It's like 17 yards deep or further. Mm-hmm. You know, we're used to seeing those things in a cutter style offense. And if they run the ball, they can run the ball. If they can't, they can't. But, you know, it, it, this was actually addressed. Uh, Bruce Arians had his, you know, total access with Casey today. And he's like, he's like, you know, yes, it's sort of the concept of between cutters and his offense are still the same. But he's like, make no doubt about it. We're here to run the ball. Mm hmm. And that's what you saw, especially on that drive. The last one for the Panthers got it. We went down and kicked the field goal. It's like they got the ball with, what, nine minutes left? Mm-hmm. And they just ran it down the field through here and there to pick up first downs when they had to or to sort of keep the defense off balance. But they definitely went to running the ball, and Jameis was letting the clock go down to one before he hiked it. And mm-hmm. that's what they want to do. And I, I you know, mean, if it if it just backs it up at all, uh, the, the play breakdown, the Buccaneers ran 31 uh, running plays and only 25 passing plays. Yeah. Versus the Carolina Panthers in this particular game, they ran 19 running plays and 51 passing plays. And yeah, they didn't score a, a touchdown. That's the difference between being behind in a game and being ahead. Right. You know, that Panthers stat line you just gave, that's a stat line that we heard 10, 11, 12, like, I don't know, more than that, 30, 40, 50 times during the cutter era. Sure. You absolutely. Know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like 45, 50 passes. 19, 21, 22 runs. Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, that was it. And it's like, hey, we're top five team in passing. Who cares? We're five and yeah. 11. Right. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. It's because we're down, like, you know, we're down 45 to 17 you know, at kickoff at, at second half. You know, right. it's like, so, and, you know, th- that's the difference. Like that right. last drive that we had before the kneel down is why that that skew that you talked about uh-huh. as run ratio, that's where it happened. Okay. So, so I want to connect this to something else, right? One of the, the pictures or the graphics that I continue to see pop up over the course of this entire weekend, and it keeps popping up in my social media feeds. Um, I see it, uh, you know, online there, it's a graphic of Jameis and it's saying, you know, he has the most interceptions in the league and the most fumbles lost in the league and the most, I forget what the third stat was. Total um, turnovers? Total, nah, was it total turn? I forget exactly what it was. But, like, when you look at that, like, like so y- you flip this to what you're just saying of, like, we're passing so many times, right? Mm-hmm. Well, interceptions are made on passing plays. The, Since the, when? I know, exactly. But the, typically, when you get a, a, a fumble um, or a lost fumble from a quarterback, a lot of times it's because they've dropped back, they're waiting to pass, they're waiting for a play to develop or, or something like that. They're not, they're not going to be fumbling the ball off of, a, off of a running play, usually. I'm not saying it never happens, but, but very rarely. So when, you put, when we put our quarterback into a situation where he is having to, to throw the ball 50, 60 times because we're constantly playing from behind, as we have been for the past five years of his career, four years of his career, to be honest. Um, like, I okay, and maybe this is me just being a Jameis apologist. Like, of course he's going to have those numbers. You know, like, well, like it's 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 I'm finding it hard to blame Jameis Winston for having a high number of these of these numbers when we've been in these situations where he's having to pass it all the damn time for the last three years. Right. And this kind of goes back to, you know, even it was something I had written down for Greg, but we never sort of got to it, uh-huh. uh, you know, where he falls down on sort of like, you know, the national pundits are Bruce Arians here to fix Jameis mm-hmm. and Byron Leftwich is like, there's nothing wrong with Jameis. You know, mm-hmm. we asked that question to JP Peterson. I think it was the first one out of the gate, right. You know, when he was on, um, and like I said, never sort of got around to Greg because we just Jameis never came up. And honestly, I was kind of thankful for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
yeah, you know, when Bruce Arians got here, he said, he's like, there's nothing wrong with Jamie. He's got to get better people around him mm-hmm. or play better around him. Well, here we are. Here we right, are. Right. Now, here's the whole other side of that, because watching Jameis in this past game specifically, I'm not I'm not talking about so much the San Francisco game, but this game, um, a lot of people are like, oh, if Jameis can just manage the game, just right. manage the game. Like I, we have said this, you know, several times before, like I don't necessarily want Jameis to just manage the game. Like I want him to be who he is. Like one of the things we saw in this game several times was him escaping, uh, you know, using his feet to get out of, uh, you know, sticky situations uh, with pressure coming mm-hmm. and stuff. We we saw it like like I want to see Jameis be kind of the the fiery uh you know, I, I don't want to say gunslinger. That's not really the right word, but like, like I want to see him be, I, I guess himself. You want, you want to see him to take chances. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, like not throw 51 times during the game yeah, either. Yeah. Not triple coverage because, you know, well, you know, I know Mike will help me out. I trust Mike. Right. So I'll throw in a triple coverage and wow, he didn't get it. Oh, well, 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 I, well, I just got to be better. I just yeah. got to be better. <laughs> you know, I got to protect football. Yeah, that's that's sort of the fine line. And there are some things about this you can see Jameis like wanting to do what the coach is telling him. Like it was the Steelers game, the very first preseason game, and you know, mm-hmm. Jameis sort of rolled out, got some pressure, made a guy miss, rolled out, tucked the ball and ran. Mm-hmm. And one of the beat reporters said, Hey, you know, what about that player Jameis ran? And Bruce Aaron said, Well, I'd rather have him keep his eyes up the field and throw the ball. Mm-hmm. And Jameis took a sack, I know at least one in Carolina. Because he was doing that, like right. the field was open to him, mm-hmm. you know, he could have went and got like, you, you know, from the TV coverage, you couldn't see how far back the middle linebacker was, mm-hmm. but you know, he would have got positive yards for sure. Right. But he kept looking, kept looking, kept looking. And finally the protection broke down for a sack, you know, later in the game on that last drive where we needed points, where it was time to take chances, Jameis took off and ran for a first down. So, I personally would like Jameis to take off more, but mm-hmm. his head coach and his offensive coordinator is telling him not to. Right. Um, so it's sort of this happy medium. Like in the uh, yeah, in the Panthers game, the one the touchdown I've talked about to Mike Evans time after time. You know, I think it might have been their first drive where he threw a dime and Mike didn't put a go up with two hands and get it. Uh, you know, ended up going off his hand and it's incomplete and it's fourth down and I think we kicked a field goal. Uh, Dario Ugumbwale, <laughs> Dario Ugumbwale, Ugumbwale. Was, was wide open for a first down. Mm-hmm. But the way he's been taught is if that deep shot is there, take it. Like mm-hmm. Jameis could have checked it down, moved the sticks, you know, first down inside the red end zone. Here we go. But and you can't blame him because the throw was there. Right. Like the it should have been caught. Mm hmm. You know, we've seen Mike make much harder catches than that. So, you know, going back and looking at it and saying, oh, because there was a chance that he took. Right. But that was a chance of how he's being told to be coached. Again, I would like to see him run for first downs more when the daylight is there. Uh, is it because maybe, you know, I'm a little gun shy because I've seen Jameis sort of make dumb decisions, you know, outside the pocket sometimes. I know he's got like, oh, outside the pocket under pressure, you know, chaos, whatever. Jameis is great at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, you know, I just watched him throw a pick six to seal a game against the 49ers right. when there was chaos going on. Right. You know, so it's, you know. I guess manage the game as fans. We sort of think of like the Alex Smith types who's never really won anything. They win a lot of regular season games, but you know, when you got to put the team on your back type of deal and make that drive or make that throw, he's not the guy for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but if manage the game means to Jameis Winston, because I did see him take the shot with Mike, take the shot with Perriman, sure. score the touchdown with Godwin, roll out. Godwin was running the opposite way, put on the brakes and came back. Jameis hit him for a first down. You know, those are are are, are taking chances from what was there. Uh, but if manage the game to Jameis means like don't take those stupid chances until like you absolutely have to like the mm-hmm. fourth quarter and we need to score this drive type of deal. Like I can live with that if that's what means if what managing the game means to Jameis. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'd be real interested uh, to go back to that graphic that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. I want to see the other stats that also go along with that. You know, where, well, you where need his, to, you need where to his see passing like, yards, where are his, you, you know, need, what, what you need to see is like, percentage of throws 
on those interceptions. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like how many throws did it take for him to get those interceptions and put mm-hmm. that percentage up against every other quarterback right. or put that percentage of strip sacks, fumbles while in the pocket mm-hmm. against all the other quarterbacks on the percentage that they've dropped back. Right. Well, and, no, I'm not, I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, trying to mitigate the graphic they put up. I'm just, you know, those were pretty negative things that they, that they showed. Mm-hmm. I want to see the, I want to see the three most positive things about Jameis as well. Like what are, what are the three, you know, best things we could also say about Jameis? Like, uh, you know, however, you know, however many passing yards he's had, at, you know, at his age. Um, I'm not really. I don't t- really number like of that touchdowns. Age. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. Or maybe you know, by games came, played. I guess because he came in the league like two years earlier than everybody than most, else. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like this Patrick Mahomes thing that's going around. Right. right. No one said that. You know. Jameis was, you know, the all-time leader of 300-yard games before 24. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes did it in one year and one game. Like, mm-hmm. Jameis took three years to do it. Like, right. it's not a fair comparison. Right, right. Um, but but I, I would like to say, all right, Ren, I've got one more thing that I want to talk about uh, sure. coming out of this game, and it's Peyton Barber. Um, now, we talked about it a little bit with Greg, but, you know, Bruce Arians really pumped up Peyton Barber. He's like, you know, I, I still hear it in my head of, we got to run him back, y'all. Like, yeah. oh, we got to run him back. And, and you know, I went back and watched a little bit of, of our game, but, you know, this was a weekend where I really got to got a chance to watch all the other games. Because uh, right. usually I'm I'm traveling to Tampa, traveling home from Tampa. I don't get a chance to watch the other games a ton. Um, and by the time we get into everything, it's it's I'm not doing that. But I got to watch the other games, and I'm looking at some of these other running backs around the league. And gosh, who did I watch this weekend? I watched the I watched New Orleans. I watched uh, Green Bay. Who else did I watch? I, I forget who else I watched. Um, yeah, I flipped around between a couple of them, and I was watching kind of their running backs. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't know that if you were to press me on it, I couldn't tell you, tell me about a specific play or tell me whatever. But like in general, I just remember going, you know, Peyton Barber's fine. Like he's kind of a steady Eddie, you know, 3.7 yards or, you know, right at four, four yards. He's not going to get pushed back a whole lot, Mm-mm. but it's, he's in a different class of running back than some of these other guys that are out there in the league. Like yeah. he, he's not going to break open that run. He's not going to shake off so, like an Alvin Kamara. Like you look at that guy, like that guy can, can thread a needle and just keep going. You right. know what I mean? Like Peyton Barber is not, he's not that. All right, I, I think I know where you're going with this. And, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll kind of, uh, you know, I sort of snuck it in with Greg and I, I think he laughed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we were talking about Rojo and, you know, he's on his rookie deal and like, you know, you know, basically with a rookie running back, you, you know, you want to, you know, ride him hard and put him away wet, paraphrasing what I said. You know, it's okay. just like, you know, wear him out while they're young and cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why 30 year old running backs sort of fall off the shelf because all the pounding they take. Now, I'm a big believer in that the offensive line makes the running back, except okay. for about five, six guys in the league. And we know who they are because we're facing them all coming right up in a row right you know all those guys that got drafted in the first round of your fantasy draft that's who i'm talking about Mm -hmm. you know maybe one or two coming back the other way but if you pick first and you grab you know we'll say you grab barkley or kamara or McCaffrey, whichever one of those three you wanted on the way back and you picked first all those guys are gone now like they're gone right so yes there is something to getting a running back but it has to be one of those guys and those guys go top 10 usually mm-hmm. in the first round unless it seems to be like Chris McCaffrey I don't think made the top 10 but it was a crazy deep class like right there's like five running backs went in the first round right you know Kamara was you know a steal in the third round you know mm-hmm. Kareem Hunt used to play for the Chiefs now suspended he was also like a, a fine in the third round mm-hmm. but you know it's it's more about the offensive line unless you get one of these guys, the Elliots, the Kamaras, the, you know, and to get those guys, you probably got to be drafting pretty high. But what the problem is, if you're drafting that high, chances are your offensive line kind of stinks. Right. And it's going to take right. some years, you know, it's going to yeah. take some years to really get this running back to their full potential. Mm-hmm. You know, even though Barkley ran for so many yards and Greg told us how many catches he got, how many games did the Giants win? You know, Barkley's the yeah. best line, but, you know, Barkley's yeah. the best running back in the league. How many games did they win last year? That's, I I don't know off the top of my head, but it wasn't many. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Where where did they pick this past year? They picked fourth? 
I, I don't say. know. So I, I mean, they they had to have been worse than the Buccaneers' record. It had to have been worse than five and eleven, yeah. or at five and eleven. So I mean, yeah, it, it's it's more it about the off right? again. It's it's yeah. more about sort of the offensive line than it sure. is there. And you know, I didn't like the way Peyton ran week one. You know, sort of Rojo picked up a slack. I thought he ran a lot harder. I thought he's very indecisive week one. Mm-hmm. I thought he ran a lot harder week two. I thought there was a couple of spots where if he sort of kept his head up. uh he could have bounced the outside and, you know, maybe got some more yards. Um, but, you know, what I saw in the Carolina game, Peyton Barber is who Peyton Barber is. You know, at first he was a guy who was going to get you what was there. Now he's yeah. a guy that's going to get you what's there and then get you an extra couple yards because he's going to spin off the tackle and fall forward. And, mm-hmm. you know, if if you give him a hole and he hits it and he gets like a yard or two before anyone touches him, well, now you're looking at like second and five. Right. Second and four. You know, the problem has been that he gets the ball and he's got to make somebody miss before he gets to the line of scrimmage. And right. then, then by the time he gets to the line of scrimmage, the linebacker has shot the, shot the gap. Mm-hmm. So now he's got to make that guy miss. Or if he doesn't, he catches him and he falls forward and he falls forward for a yard or two yard, you know, one, two, three yards. So right. I, I think you can win with either one of them. I mean, it's nice to have one of these explosive guys, but, you know, uh, even though Kamara is great, and he's a big part of the Saints offense. Like we saw what they did when Breeze went out. They did nothing against the Rams. Mm-hmm. You know, you got Kamara, like, you know, Ezekiel Elliott uh, got a great offense line in front of him. You know, uh, they just can't do it by yourself. The Giants didn't make the playoffs. The Panthers with McCaffrey didn't make the playoffs. It's like mm-hmm. having a running back doesn't guarantee you anything. Yes, it's a nice piece to have, and I would like to have that piece, and maybe Rojo becomes sort of that piece, you know, one of these top ten guys where, you know, he, he gets drafted in the first two rounds of fantasy football, but it's it's – I don't think we need him. I just don't. I just don't think we need to, you know – if you discover somebody late in the rounds and pops up, okay, great. You know, yeah. Cutter said it, and I agree with him. You can find running backs anywhere. You can find running backs, wide receivers, linebackers, mm-hmm. anywhere. Well, I mean, Bruce Arians kind of said something similar, just not in those words, where he said, I don't pay too much money for the running back position. Yeah. I just, yeah. yeah it's he not, doesn't pay it in free agency. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it just, it is what it is, and, and uh, you know, you go. So, you know, maybe those aren't really uh, – I don't. I, I feel like a lot of times we wind up making too much out of that running back position with where it is. But you know, kind of, kind of to what you were just talking about. Like Peyton Barber may never break off the big run. He's not going to lose us yards. He's going to push us forward. And you know, we wind up running the ball. I don't know what I say. Thirty-one times in this past game. You know, it balances out the offense. And you know, we see what happens. We see what the result of that can be, especially when it comes down to a one-score game. So, all right, Randall. Well, that that's really it for me as far as any you know final thoughts that I had coming out of this week as we start to turn the corner here. Uh, did did you have anything you wanted to talk about real quick before we sign off? Carlton Davis is getting jobbed. He's getting a lot of like the the first two weeks. He's getting sort of a lot of these ticky tack fouls you know pass interference oh you're talking about from the from the refs yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you know it's it, it, he doesn't have the reputation yet because he plays a lot like you know i'm not saying he is but he plays a lot like sherman you know he he's mm-hmm. he's physical he's his hands are on you he's a big guy he makes you like sort of run around him and center run through him mm-hmm. and uh you know and he's really sticky and he's getting called for these ticky tack touchy things that uh you know in both games now i understand the face mask and yes he got bailed out because of replay on that, you know, DPI on that mm-hmm. last drive, you know, by the Panthers. But, you know, uh, a fourth down against the San Francisco game where the receiver just sort of ran into him, mm-hmm. you know, and, he, you know, like there was nothing he could do. And they call it, you know, oh, you touched him. And it's like but he didn't slow him down or it was he didn't grab him. It was nothing. And then, right. you know, that that phantom holding call that negated the Kevin Minter interception mm-hmm. you know, it was just I just feel like he's he's getting jobbed right now and I don't does know he have what a target the... like does he because you hear that right like the rough the ref study tape too like they know where where people are and what people are doing like is is he kind of a guy who's developing a reputation you think among the refs no, that causes I don't think he's being targeted I think just the way that he plays corner uh-huh. is the way the NFL doesn't want you to play corner you know what I mean? Which but, is playing corner correctly. Yeah, <laughs> which is playing by the rules. You know. But, uh, I, you know, I'm just I, – I tweeted this out, you know, watching that Monday night game. It's like I'm ready for – I remember every year I fe- you feel this. Like the rest are terrible. Everything's ticky-tack. They're calling everything. Mm-hmm. And then somewhere – I don't know which we- what week it is, but somewhere they start to let up. 
Right. You know, all that like falling. Remember all that crap about falling on a quarterback? Yep. Like yep. last year, it was like it cost I don't know whoever was playing Green Bay or like it cost Green Bay a game. Yeah. You know, and then you know they got uh, and it cost the uh, the Broncos a game uh, mm-hmm. Sunday night. Yeah. Like there is no way that that Chubb fell on Trubisky. He right. just sacked him. You know, it's so I think when the refs let up on this, you know, micromanaging of a football game uh, and let the guys play a little more, I think Davis will be fine. But uh, I just right now, I just think he's getting jobbed. Yeah, I I can't uh, I can't argue with that because you're right. A lot of them really are the sort of, as you say, the, the ticky tack type penalties. And honestly, those are the kind of penalties that ruin games. Mm-hmm. for everybody you know it, it just it makes them not as fun to watch anymore when you when you kind of start pulling that crap so like that judah j barima call right right he wasn't even looking that side of the field like you just gave an automatic first down on fourth down where he overthrew the receiver yeah. Yeah. on a holding call that was way on the other side of the field and it really wasn't that bad of a yeah. hold he, yeah he touched now, he grabbed him a little bit but he wasn't even like it, it didn't affect the play whatsoever yeah those are the ones that really get me is when you have a play you have a penalty that didn't affect the play at all yeah and it changes the outcome of of really the game in in a lot of ways but at least yeah, certainly we, that play or the or the momentum and you know the refs just shouldn't be involved in that in that way but anyway we're not here to comment on the refs we're here to talk about the bucks so uh ren with that uh, i think that's going to do it for our show this week uh, big thanks to greg Almond. you guys make sure you go check out his stuff over at theathletic.com you guys will definitely want to do that as well uh coming up later this week we will have a final thoughts from you guys we've given our final thoughts now it's going to be time for final thoughts from you we've got our emails comments and questions show coming up uh and that'll be coming out here in just the next day or so and then at the end of the week we are coming out with our buck in the news show for week three that is the week the show where we'll be taking all of the news not just from this week ren but really kind of from the uh week and a half that it's been since the buccaneers have had a game and we'll be kind of compacting all that into one show as we start to really uh, dial into this uh, Giants game coming up this weekend. Ren, uh, with that, why don't you tell the folks out there where they can find you on the internet? The best place to find me is on Twitter at Rendax, R-E-N underscore D-A-X-T. I'm always down to talk some Buccaneers football. And if you guys want to get in touch with me, you can find me at Brent Allen Live across all the social medias. And the show, if you want to be one of these people that gets in on these uh, you know, these email shows, send us an email to thepewtercast at gmail.com. We'll catch up with that on a future episode of The Pewtercast. Also, if you want to just get in touch with us real time, find us on Twitter at The Pewtercast is the handle there. Find us over on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Pewtercast. And don't forget you can also join us sunday nights after the games uh usually about 10 o'clock we'll be going live uh, with our instant cast most of the time it's going to be a call-in show this particular week it won't be i'll be on the road uh, unfortunately so the studio won't be set up for that but ren you are going to be live um after the game on sunday night with the instant cast and you have a guest this time so we're definitely looking forward to that um Yes, special guest. Special guest. Mystery guest. Mystery guest, yeah. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Uh, So you guys make sure you join us for that as well. I'd also like to say thank you to all of our patrons who continually support the computer cast. You guys are awesome. Uh, We love you guys. If you want to find out more about that, just go over to patreon.com forward slash computer cast and you can support the show there or go to huntakiller.com. Don't forget about your special promo code pewter cast to get 20% off that first book. Well, Ren, that is all the homework or or all the housekeeping we have for the show as well. So uh, with that, we'll close the show out as always. Go Bucks.